words that you are opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. And we come to you, Lord, in humility of heart, recognizing that if you do not come in the power of your Spirit to help us, we will never truly profit from your word. And therefore, we ask, O Lord, that you would be our help. We ask that in our feelings of weakness, Lord, you would give us the strength in order that we may truly profit from the ministry of your word. We pray that your word would come with power. We pray for him who seeks to open your word. Grant clarity of thought and clarity of speech. Grant unction from the Holy Spirit. And we pray for all the hearers. Grant all hearts ready to embrace the truths of your holy word. Lord, shape our thinking, mold our living by your truth. For these things we plead in Jesus' name. Amen. In our afternoon services, we have been considering from Scripture the blessings bestowed in the application of salvation or the doctrine of the Christian life. God's work of Original creation was ruined by the fall of man into sin. Therefore, the next great work of God that the Bible speaks about is the work of salvation. This salvation God planned from eternity. He revealed through prophecy and particularly through his covenants. Then he accomplished that salvation in history by sending his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. To accomplish salvation. And then God applies that salvation to sinful humanity. And in applying that salvation accomplished by Christ in history, there are many blessings given. In our previous studies, we have already considered some of them. The effectual call, regeneration, the new birth, conversion justification and this is now the third Sunday but we will be looking at the blessing bestowed another blessing bestowed in the application of salvation adoption now in dealing with this blessing bestowed in the application of salvation we have already considered the biblical concept of adoption when we think of adoption as a blessing given in the application of salvation, we must not think of this in terms of the Trinitarian father and son relationship. That is exclusive to the Father and the Lord Jesus. Exclusive in terms of Jesus as the only one and only Son of God the Father. Nor are we talking about creative father and son relationship, the relationship that all human beings have with God by virtue of the fact that God is the creator of everything, the sustainer of everything. In him we live and move and exist. It is God was the one who is the one who gives to all life and breath and all things. And therefore, in that sense, we are all Believers and unbelievers alike, children of God. But that is not what we're talking about when we talk about the blessing bestowed in the application of salvation, adoption. Nor are we talking about the theocratic father and son relationship. That unique relationship that the nation of Israel had with God. The physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God delivered them from the bondage in Egypt. And God entered into covenant with them in Mount Sinai. And they became the special object of God's protection and provision. The special objects of his kindness and goodness. 
And they were all called sons and daughters of God. But that is a relationship by virtue of God's delivering them from the bondage of Egypt. And the old covenant that God made with the nation of Israel was not a saving covenant. It was a covenant of common grace. So when we talk about adoption as a blessing bestowed in the application of salvation, we are talking about salvific father and son relationship. The relationship in which we enter into by virtue of faith in Christ. The experience of deliverance from the bondage of sin. Entering into God's family, which John 1 speaks about. For as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's the blessing bestowed in the application of salvation. And then having considered the biblical concept of adoption, we then move to consider the privileges of adoption. And we have already considered that the central primary blessing of adoption is the spirit of adoption. If since we are God's sons, God also sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And then another privilege of adoption is not only the spirit of adoption, but the special care of God, his protection and provision. And then we have also seen another blessing, that blessing of, or the privilege of family inheritance. If you are sons, then you are heirs through God. And then another privilege of adoption, which we have already considered, is the fatherly discipline of God. Well, having considered all of those, the biblical concept of adoption, the privileges of adoption, now we will focus this afternoon, thirdly and finally, on, on the duties of adoption. The duties of adoption. Along with the privileges of adoption that is ours in Christ, they are also duties founded and grows out of the blessing of adoption. Whenever there are privileges given, there are always corresponding responsibilities that grow out of that privilege. And what are the duties of adoption? Well, the biblical teaching can be summarized under four headings. First, duty of adoption is the duty of imitating God, our Heavenly Father. The duty of imitating God. Just as children do and all to imitate their own earthly fathers, so as children of God, we are to imitate God, our heavenly Father. Two texts of scripture sets this duty very clearly. The first one is Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 verse 44 to 48. 
The Lord Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount addressing his own disciples who have believed in Christ, who have been delivered from the bondage of sin. And he says in verse 44, But I say to you, verse 43, you have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect. As your heavenly father is perfect. What we Christians do to those who hate us. Should be patterned after how God deals with those who hate him. Even in God's wrath and anger towards the wicked, God in mercy is still kind and gracious to them. If God is kind and gracious to those who hate him and violate his law, then if you are his child, by virtue of adoption, you must also be kindly disposed to those who hate you and seek to harm you. And why? Verse 48, Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. God, if God is your heavenly father through redemption from sin, then it is your duty to be like your heavenly father. Since God is perfect, then you have to make it your goal to be perfect. And although this goal is never realized in this life, it does not mean that you are to lower the goal. You have to continually aim for perfection because God is perfect. You have to strive to be Perfect. We have to be like our heavenly father. Anything less than that is unacceptable. Anything less than that should not be our goal. Why try to be perfect when, why practice to be perfect when no one can be perfect through practice? Well, because God is our heavenly father and he is perfect and therefore we have to strive to be perfect. You cannot make it less your goal to be than what your father is like. It is your duty. You cannot say, but I can't be like that. I don't want to be like that. I do not, I cannot attain to it. Yes, you can't in this life, but that doesn't mean you are to lower your goal. You have to strive to be perfect. So Christian, are you taking this duty of imitation 
seriously. Are you not only, you see, you are not only to view your privilege as God's sons and daughters and rejoice in the fact and in the light of those privileges, you have also to remember your duty. As a child of God, you are to be like your heavenly Father. So are you taking this duty seriously? Or have you somehow lowered the goal? Do you pray for those who carnally hate you and seek to harm you? Because although it may be against everything in you, you have to be like your father. Do you act kindly towards them, those who hate you and seek your harm, your enemies, in spite of the fact that they carnally hate you and want to harm you? That's the duty. We cannot simply bask on the privilege. We have to remember our duty. Another text where this is clearly set forth is Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. And following, Paul says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you, and gave himself up for you, for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. As God's children, we Christians are exhorted to be imitators of God. That is our solemn duty. And in what are you particularly to imitate God as his Children, well, it is in having a gracious disposition towards each other as members of God's family. And this gracious disposition is to be particularly expressed in two ways. First, in forgiving each other. Verse, 40, verse 32 of chapter 4, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. In the community of God's people here on earth, we will sin against each other. That is a given. That's something that you can only expect, for none is perfect. And there is no such thing as a perfect church because all members are not perfect. Sinning against one another is a given. And the more we rub shoulders with one another, the more intimately we know each other, the more we will sin against each other. The closer we become. Therefore, a gracious disposition is essential. And this gracious disposition concretely shows itself in being kind to one another, tender-hearted, in forgiving each other. Just as God in Christ has forgiven us. Minor offenses that are of no significant consequence, you should overlook. 
Proverbs 19.11, a man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. But major offenses that are of serious consequence should be firmly yet graciously dealt with. And when there is repentance, there should be genuine forgiveness. This is how your heavenly Father deals with you. And that is how you are to deal with fellow members of God's family. We are to imitate our Father. Be imitators of God as His beloved children. Moreover, this gracious disposition is not only to be particularly expressed in forgiving each other, but also particularly to be expressed in giving. Verse 1 of chapter 5, Therefore be imitators of God as Beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. God the Father gave us his Son. The Son in love, our elder brother, gave himself up for us. And as children, you, Christian, must imitate God and imitate your elder brother, the firstborn, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is your duty as his child by redemption from Sin. And we can add to this the other attributes of God, his faithfulness, his justice, his wisdom, his holiness. If God is your heavenly father, then you are to be like your father. So never excuse yourself for failing to be like your father. Never say, well, you know. No. You can't make it less your goal to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. You have to strive to imitate and to be like your heavenly father. No excuses for anything less than perfection. Every imperfection must be mourned and repented of. And although on earth that is something that we must continually do, because on earth we will never be perfect, we must mourn, we must repent, we must continue to deal with and humbly accept our own failures. And we must never lower the goal. You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But then there is another duty of adoption. Not only the duty to imitate God, our heavenly Father, but secondly, the duty of living in godly fear for God. Living in godly fear for God. And the key text here is 1 Peter chapter 1. So I want you to turn there. And I want us to take a closer look at this passage. 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter writing to the believers 
scattered in different places in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, etc. He exhorts them and tells them in verse 17 of chapter 1, If you address us Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as the lamp and blemish and spotless, the blood of Christ. Conduct yourself in fear. If you address as Father, the one who impartially judges, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. That's the duty. And by fear here, Peter is not referring to a cringing fear that will make you want to run away from God and hide from God and have nothing to do with God. No, but by fear, he is referring to a godly fear for God. It refers to a deep sense of respect for God that you will never treat him carelessly. And casually, but seriously and lovingly. That's fear. The godly fear for God. Now that is the duty of all those who are God's children. A deep sense of respect for your heavenly father. You do not treat him carelessly. You do not walk before him casually and carelessly. But you take him seriously. And deal with him lovingly. That's a godly fear for God. And why? Should you have this godly fear for God as his children? Why? First, notice in the passage, because of who God is. Your heavenly father. Who is he? Verse 17. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear. During the time of your stay on earth. God is the one who impartially judges according to each one's work. That's your heavenly father. That is who he is. And that is why you must conduct yourself in fear. In a godly fear towards God during the time of your stay on earth. Now imagine with me that your heavenly father is a drug-busting czar. His work is to get rid of all the drug pushers and rehabilitate all drug users in our country. And your dad really believes in the cause and he is a man of integrity and principle. Now, if you ever, if you were ever to get involved in drug pushing or drug use, do you think your dad will spare you? If he is an impartial judge. No, he won't. In fact, because he is your father, he will focus on you to let you stop doing what you're doing. 
he will never tolerate. His children selling drugs or using drugs. If he is an impartial judge, judgment must begin in his house. His children. And the same is true of God, your heavenly Father. Thus, later in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, notice what Peter says. For it is time for judgment to begin. Where? With the household of God. And if begins with us first, believers, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Where will judgment begin? In God's house. The members of his own family. He will never tolerate his children from continue to do and violate just his laws wantonly. All acts then of discipline from God are acts of judgment from God. And where does it begin? His family, his household, his house. Therefore, child of God, never take your heavenly father lightly or carelessly. Treat him reverentially and take him seriously. When David sinned against God, committed adultery with Bathsheba, and put to death the man in order to cover his tracks, and he can marry Bathsheba, God did not simply turn a blind eye. God forgave David. David, you shall not die. But God says, David, the sword will never depart from your house. Judgment begins in my house. My friend, don't think. God is my heavenly father. I can be careless in the way I live. I can treat God's laws carelessly and wantonly. No. He will do what he can to stop you. From doing what he hates people are doing. And if you wantonly disregard God's law carelessly, you will experience the rod of his discipline. So there must be a godly fear for God. God will not spare me. God wants me to share in his holiness. God is the impartial judge who will judge according to, who will render to each according to his works, to his deeds. God will never spare you. He will begin with you. He will do something to make you stop. Because God wants that you regard him and his laws. Seriously. So the duty of a godly fear for God. 
if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. Those who are not members of God's household, he may not deal with them and discipline them in this lifetime as much as he would his own children. You see, if you do something stupid, somebody who is not your father He's, he's not, he's not going to mind so well. But your dad, if he's a righteous dad, you'll fear him first. He's not going to spare you. So a godly fear for God. But the second... Or secondly, another reason why you must have this godly fear for God if you are his child is because of what God has done for you. In verse 17, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. Verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb and blemish and spotless, the blood of Christ. The second reason is intimately related to the first and must never be divorced from the first. Peter is saying, think of what God has done for you. As the one who impartially judges according to each one's work. Think of what he has done for you. He has redeemed you from sin. Not with silver and gold. But with nothing less than the blood of his own son. So. Are you just going to take God, your heavenly father, lightly and carelessly and disrespectfully after all that he has done for you? I'll never forget Spurgeon's illustration about the two boys who were going through an orchard of apples. And one of the boys said, let's steal some apples. They look so delicious. Let's steal them. The other protested and said, no, we should not steal. But the other said, but ah, the guy who owns this place is a very gracious person. He gives a lot to others anyway. And he will forgive us if ever we will get caught. But the other boy said, but you see, that's precisely my problem. It is hard to do something wrong against the owner. He is so gracious, loving, and forgiving. I have experienced so much of his kindness. It's hard for me to do something that would ever displease him, that would ever disappoint him. Christian, think of how gracious God has been to you. How can you ever treat God, your heavenly Father, lightly, despisingly, carelessly, casually? It is our duty as his children to live in a godly fear for God. Never to take him lightly. 
never to treat him carelessly. Turn to Malachi 1. And God demands this from us. In Malachi chapter 1. And here God is speaking to his old covenant people. Who were in a common grace covenant with the children of Israel. And notice the sins God confronts the nation of Israel with. In verse 6. A son honors his father. And a servant his, is his master. Then if I am a father. Where is my honor? And if I am a master. Where is my respect says the Lord of hosts. See, God says, I am a father to you. Where is that respect you all to give me? And if this, this was true of the sonship of the Israelites under the old covenant, whose deliverance was not a deliverance from the bondage of sin, but from the bondage of Egypt, a common grace, sonship, how much more those who have experienced deliverance from the bondage of sin. A saving grace. Sanjay. A godly fear for God. That is our duty. Therefore, Christian, live in this godly fear. For God. Do not just think of the privileges of adoption. Think of your duty. Ask God to put this fear of Him in your heart and use the means God has given you to increase this godly fear for God, your heavenly Father. This is what you owe him as your heavenly father. But then that leads us to a third duty of adoption. Not only the duty of imitating God, your heavenly father. Not only the duty of a godly living in a godly fear for God, your heavenly Father, but also, thirdly, the duty of submission to God, your heavenly Father. Just as it is the duty of a son to submit to his parents, whatever be their will is, obey them in all things, so it is our duty to submit to God, our Heavenly Father. And the language of our hearts should be what Christ said to His own Heavenly Father. Not my will, but your will be done. And although Jesus pleaded that the Father will spare him, and he pleaded earnestly, if possible, let this cup, and yet Jesus always stayed in a posture of humility and submission before his heavenly Father, not my will, but your will be done. And this submission must be expressed in two ways. God's will revealed in his word. The declarative aspect of God's will. And God's will revealed in his providence. The decretive aspect of his will. Whatever God's will is for you as revealed in his word. You have to submit to it. You have to obey. And that is because God is your heavenly Father. In Matthew 12 
and verse 48. Notice the language. Beginning from verse 46, while he was still speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. Someone said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Who are those who are members of God's family? Those who do or are doing the will of God the Father in heaven. And Jesus says, whoever does that, he is a member of the family. He is my brother, my sister, my mother. And if God is your heavenly father, then you will have to submit to his will as revealed in his word. You have to do whatever he tells you to do in scriptures. You can say, no, I won't do that. No, I won't do this. You cannot pick and choose. You remember the Lord Jesus in the Great Commission. He said to his original disciples, going therefore make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, that is those who have been made disciples in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, that is those who have been made disciples, to observe, not just to know, to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We cannot pick and choose what we want to obey from God's word. Whatever God says we must do. If you are a child of God, it is your obligation to submit to obey. Now there are a lot of areas in life where God has the, given us the liberty to make our own wise and responsible choices. But when it comes to when there is an express command of God in scriptures, as his children, we must submit, we must obey. We must say with the Lord Jesus, not my will, but your will be done. You're my father. And this submission is also true of God's will revealed in providence. The decretive aspect of his will that is the ultimate cause of all reality. And we know that aspect of his will when it happens in providence. We must learn to submit to that aspect of his will. As well. In James chapter 4, and James come very strongly upon this because you see, Christians may see the seriousness of sinning or in submission to the revealed will of God in scriptures, but don't really feel so bad about the fact that they are often insubmissive to God's will revealed in providence. In James 4 and verse 13, so James comes and addresses this particular issue 
in very strong words. He says in James 4 and verse 13, Come now you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live. And also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. See what he's saying? In making plans, you have to be conscious that your will is not supreme. But God's will is supreme. Your heavenly father. And you must live in recognition and in willing submission to God's revealed will in providence. If the Lord wills, you must constantly and willingly seek to modify or change your plans as God's will in providence unfolds. In order to make your plans fit God's will revealed in providence. To be angrily frustrated with God in his will revealed in providence. You cannot get your way. Your plans are dashed to pieces and to try to insist on your own will by violating God's revealed will in his word is in submission not just to God's revealed will in his word but also in submission to God's will revealed in providence. Even if his revealed will or his will revealed in providence is difficult and painful. We must willingly embrace. My will is not supreme. The will of God is supreme. So if God blocks my plans in providence... I must acknowledge that his will is supreme and I must willingly submit to it and revise my plans to fit his own. Because he is my heavenly father. You see, we all your, your children are all around the table and they have all their kinds of idea of what vacation you will have. And dad says, no, I have thought about this. I have listened to you. No, that is not what we are going to do. And all the children should say, okay, dad, not our will, your will. Now, if you're a child of God, that is your duty. If you react in angry frustration and even rebel against God's will revealed in his word because you really want to get what you want, then you are not only rebelling against God's will revealed in his word, you are rebelling against his will revealed in providence. If the Lord will. And everything must be conditioned on that. We can plan we can ask God, Lord, 
please. But if God in providence refuses, no, I have other plans for you. Submit. Don't rebel. If you're a child of God, that's your duty. That's a duty of adoption. And although in a sense that's true of all of God's creatures, not especially true of those who have received the blessing of adoption by redemption from sin. Submission to the will of your heavenly father. His will revealed in his word. His will revealed in providence. And if you fail to do that, then you must go to your father and ask, forgive me. Forgive me. Do you ever do that when your plans are dashed? You have planned it all that you'll go to the beach to enjoy the sunlight and the sun, and then it's all cloudy and stormy, and on the way you have a blown tire, and you are so late getting into, and you're frustrated, you are angry. Well, that's in submission to God's will revealed in providence. And you must ask God to forgive you. Lord, my will is not supreme. Yours is not my will. But your will be done. And then there is a fourth and final duty of adoption. Not only the duty of imitating God, our Heavenly Father, not only the duty of living in godly fear for God, our Heavenly Father, not only the duty of submission to God, our Heavenly Father, but fourthly, the duty of trusting God, our Heavenly Father. And in a sense, this is basic of all. Now, this is something that we all expect our children to do. Trust daddy. Trust mommy. In fact, you would find it rather insulting if your children will not trust you. You will do all you can to provide for them and to protect them. And in whatever decisions you will make, that would affect them, you will have their best interest in view if you say no to them. It is because you do not think that it is really good for them. And you want your children to trust you. You tell your children, son, I know, I have been, I am more experienced. I'm saying no, you may not understand, but you have to learn to trust me. I'm your father. And the child says, oh, dad, but you don't understand. You say, no, 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 son, you can't say that. You are not as experienced as I am. I know what's best for you. Just trust in that. You want your children to trust you. You believe this is their duty. To trust you. Well, if this is true of human relationships... It is also true of the divine human relationship. 
If you are a child of God, especially by virtue from redemption, then it is doubly, if not infinitely, your duty to trust God, your Heavenly Father. God is all-powerful. Nothing is too hard for Him. God is faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. God is all wise to ever make something happen that is not intended for your spiritual good. He will never forbid you from doing something which might be good for you. That's how the devil wanted Eve and Adam to think. God's robbing you of something by forbidding you. This is good for you! No. And God will never deny you something in providence that is not really good for you. So you have to learn to trust God. If you want that from your children, You should give that to your Father in heaven. Thus Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Don't, don't lean in your limited understanding. God knows it all. We are very short-sighted. We can never see that far. We don't even know what tomorrow brings. But your father does. Don't clean on your own understanding. Trust the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. In Romans 8.28, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Those who are his children, God causes all things to work for good. Not only the good things, but even the bad things. In Matthew 7, verse 11, the Lord says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? What is good to those who ask Him? Not good according to what you think is good for you. We are not often the best judges of that. But what he thinks is good for you. A child thinks, Mom, I just want to eat chocolates all the time. Why feed me those stinking veggies? And dad and mom says, Son, daughter, it's good for you. We have to learn. We're not the best judges of what is good for us. But God is. He knows what's best for us. And Jesus, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? But you have to ask him. And if it is good, he will give it. Good for you. And in Romans 8 verse 38, or Romans 8 verse 32, Paul argues, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? If he has given us that which is so precious to him, his own son dying in the cross of Calvary. Will God give us something 
lesser. Withhold from us something lesser. It's completely illogical. If your dad is willing to give his own liver or whatever so that you will live, you think he will not give you a hundred pesos? If that were really good for you? Man, that's insanity. Therefore, child of God, it's your duty to trust your Father. Do not be guilty of littleness of faith. You insult God for littleness of faith. You dishonor God, your heavenly Father, for your littleness of faith. I would feel insulted if my sons will go around telling his buddies, you know what, I don't really trust my dad telling me not to do this because it's really what is good for me. What is this, what is this honor? To degrade what an insult. So don't insult and dishonor God, your heavenly Father, with your littleness of faith. Honor Him by trusting Him. And the more you trust Him, the more you honor Him. And the more you please Him. The more he is pleased with you, the more you trust him. And that is your duty. If you are a child of God, that is your duty. So here is another blessing given in Christ in the application of salvation, adoption. And what a glorious blessing. If this blessing is not yours, then come to Christ in faith. For as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And the privileges are yours, as well as the duties. And you say, I want the privilege. I don't want the duties. No, you can't have one without the other. You always have to have both. You can't just have the goodies without the duties. And if you become a child of God, the privileges are yours as well as the duties. And if you have received this blessing through faith in Christ, then live in the light of that reality. You are a son and daughter of God Almighty. And God has given us even plentiful of illustrations, earthly fatherhood, in order to remind us, not just of our privileges, but of our duties. This is not a duty exclusively revealed in special revelation, but even in God's works of creation. So live in the light of that reality. You are a son or daughter of God Almighty. Ask God to internalize that reality of your identity more pervasively in your heart so that you will become more and more consistent in living out the reality of it. So that when somebody will ask you, Who's your father? And you say, Earthly, heavenly.
It's never out of your mind. It controls all of your thinking and molds your living. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this blessing given in the application of salvation. We thank you that you, the great and mighty one, in need of no one, in need of nothing, would ever give this blessing of salvation, the blessing of adoption. We ask and pray that you would, Lord, write these things upon our hearts. It's so easy to know them. And yet for it to become part of our everyday thinking that will mold our living. We need the power of your Holy Spirit. We need your Spirit to take what is yours and write it upon our hearts to internalize this truth. Oh Lord, we ask and pray, do it for the sake of your name, for the honor and glory and praise of your blessed name. And we pray for those who are not yet in this father-son relationship with you by virtue of saving grace. We ask, O oh Lord, that they will seek this blessing and seek this blessing in him who alone this blessing is given the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that they will, in humility, come to him, not only for forgiveness, not only for acceptance, but even for this blessing of adoption that you give to all who come to Christ in faith. Hear us and bless your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.